So for today, I would like to start with a few examples to show you what kind of images one can obtain with uh, X-ray imaging. Let's start with the first image, and this is a transgenic mouse, a fairly general, general uh, X-ray image. We can see here um, absorption throughout the body, and we can also discern the, the legs of the mouse. However, if one selects only the areas that have high absorbance of X-rays, then we can see a very nice, very high resolution skeleton here of this transgenic mouse with the features such as the tail, the legs, the rib cage at very high resolution. Insects are also a good target for X-ray imaging. There's excellent contrast with the air, even though there's not much mass. Here you can see a mosquito. Here is the head, the antennas, and the legs. Now mosquitoes transmit a disease, and that is malaria, and we have here the blood cell imaged with X-rays, color-coded, pseudo-color-coded, um, a normal uh, red blood cell as it goes through different stages of the transfection with malaria, with the malaria parasite. With X-rays, can, one can even go to cellular resolution. Here is the H1N1 virus. We see this is a single cell organism. We can see inside the structures and we can see even at the surface, the surface uh, antennas with which the, the um, virus propagates itself. So now what do we need for bioimaging? What is essential for bioimaging? And here it is contrast. Now, how do we generate contrast with X-rays? Remember, with X-rays, we discussed last time the generation of X-rays. We bombard our um, living being or, or object with X-rays. And so what we need for generating contrast is absorption of X-rays. It's the absorption that generates the contrast. If we don't have absorption, we will get the original intensity and we will know nothing about our object. So clearly, absorption is key here, and this is the mechanism, the primary mechanism that produces contrast for X-ray imaging. And this will be the subject of today's lecture, um, uh, of this week's lecture sets, um, how, what mechanisms produce absorption of, of X-rays. So how can we describe the attenuation of X-rays? We'll just go with a, an empirical demonstration here. So, aside from that the photon might just pass through our object, what are the fates that the photon can have? It can be absorbed, so it would transfer its energy to the lattice, to the tissue, or it can be scattered. And if it is scattered, by means that we will discuss next week, um, we will not be detecting a scattered photon. So let's take a situation here where we have a tissue layer of thickness delta x here, we have n photons incident, n can be for example a thousand, ten thousand, what some, some number here. They pass through this layer of tissue of thickness delta x and after we have n minus delta n photons that continue the trajectory. Now the photons are removed according to probability law. So if we look at the number of photons that are being absorbed or scattered in a layer of thickness delta x, we'll call this number delta n. And this is given by this empirical law that the number of photons delta n, it's negative because they're being removed, is equal to, um, is proportional to the number of incident photons. That's the probability law. So if we have a thousand photons, we remove 10%. We have a hundred photons removed. We have 10,000 photons with 10% removal. We will have um, a, a thousand photons removed. The probability that they're being removed is proportional to the thickness of the layer. That also makes sense. The probability that a photon is either absorbed or scattered would increase as the number of the, the thickness of the tissue increases. That's the delta x here in this expression. And then we have a proportionality constant, this mu here, which is an empirical constant that reflects the makeup of the tissue. And this mu is called the linear attenuation coefficient. It has units 1 over centimeter uh, at which they are typically displayed. 
So, um, and it's called the linear attenuation coefficient. Linear is because of this equation here that the probability law stipulates that the number of photons removed is proportional to number of incident photons and thickness of the tissue layer. Now, in reality, and this will be the subject of today's uh, lectures, is that this linear attenuation coefficient is a function of the energy of the photon in U. It's a function of the atomic number, um, Z, and it's a function of the electron density, rho. So now we will pretend that we take this situation here, and we'll pretend that this delta X, we can assume it's a centimeter, then we'll let it go to very small values, let's say a millimeter, then a micrometer, then a nanometer, it will make it very thin, so we'll mathematically, we'll, tend, we'll let uh, delta X go to zero, and we'll have the number of photons that are being observed as a function of distance X as they pass through the tissue. So if we do that, then we can replace the difference in photons, this equation here, with the infinitesimal equation. So delta n will go to zero, so it will be dn, infinitesimal. x, dx, delta x will go to, to, to zero, so it will be replaced by the term dx. And we will obtain now the differential equation, that the derivative of the number of photons as a function of position is equal to minus mu times the number of photons at that position. That's a first order, uh, that's a differential equation, and we know the solution, the derivative of a function equals to the function times a constant, and the solution is therefore simply given by the exponent law. So, the number of photons after having passed through a tissue at position x is equal to the incident photons n0, that's the number of photons that arrive from the outside on our object, times e to the minus mu x. In this solution, we have assumed that the linear attenuation coefficient is a constant as a function of position to get this simple solution. This is simplification, but this illustrates how we get from the linear law to a exponential law of photon density. Now, the linear attenuation coefficient, as I mentioned here, is given in 1 over centimeters, and that's a unit that's not very... Um, intuitive, and so we use very often the half-value layer to describe the attenuation of a tissue. And the half-value layer is essentially defined as the thickness of material that passes one-half of the photons. So, at the number of photons at x equals to the half-value layer thickness, x hvl, is equal to the incident photons, n0, divided by 2. Half of the photons go through, and we can verify that by plugging this into the above equation. Here, if we plug this in, this relationship here, we find this relationship and the solution of that is that the half value layer, that is the x half value layer here, is equals to 0.7 divided by mu. This still doesn't say much to it, but uh, since mu is in 1 over centimeters, the unit of the half value layer is in centimeters and this is intu much more intuitive um, to grasp the ability of a material to absorb x-rays or of a tissue. And so what are typical um, half-value layers here? They are given typically for tissues it's several centimeter. It depends on the x-ray that's being used. For aluminum it's on the order of one to two centimeters and three millimeters for lead 0.3 centimeters here. So let's look at the question what are typical attenuation coefficients. So we'll look at the linear attenuation coefficient for different materials, hydrogen, water, vapor. We have air, fat, ice, water, and compact bone. Here's the density of the tissue given in grams per centimeter. Here's the density of the electrons given, uh, the electrons per mass. And then we have the electron density per volume is given here. And this is the linear attenuation coefficient. And we can see a close correspondence between the linear attenuation coefficient and the density of the electrons in the uh, tissue. Now one thing that's remarkable, if we look at the uh, density of water and the linear attenuation coefficient, we divide the linear attenuation coefficient by the density of water, be it ice or in liquid form, 
then we find that this is the same. There's a 10% difference in the linear iteration coefficient between water and ice, and there is a 10% difference in density between ice and water. So this is, means that for water, whether it's in liquid form or in solid form, once we normalize per mass, then we get the same constant. So we get a universal constant for that particular compound. And therefore, it is uh, useful to define the mass attenuation coefficient, which is mu over rho. It has the unit of centimeter squared per gram. And this would then give us a value that is constant for all forms of the same chemical substance, in this case, for example, water. So the mass attenuation coefficient is defined as the linear attenuation coefficient divided by the density of the compound. So, and this is also an explanation why we need more sunscreen in the mountains. If we go up in the mountains, the air is thinner. There is, because it is thinner, it has a lower linear attenuation coefficient. It is still the same air, so the mass attenuation coefficient would be the same, but given that the density is lower, um, up in the mountains we have um, we have more uh, less attenuation by the air. Of course, we're also higher up, so the the ultraviolet from the sun that arrives uh, has still has some distance to travel.